Thank you very much, Professor Lavanin. That was a very comprehensive overview of um, a very interesting new area of global health. I'm delighted to be here and really honored uh, for the opportunity to discuss these very interesting matters with such an august audience. I'm going to focus more um, on a practical implementation of um, a system that thrives on new media. But I'm going to focus it on institutions. And what I'll do, first of all, is to simply give you an overview of a, an actual activity that I'm leading in several African countries to try and address um, a terrible <laughs> um, global health epidemic, in my view, um, that has received very little attention to date. Um, I hope that as I describe what we are doing, a lot of the themes that have already been discussed here will pop up in of themselves and that I will be able to expand on them and to give you some indication as to why I think institutions are very critical and that technologies until they are institutionalized cannot really properly be described as innovations and that even as new media begins to thrive, we must consider the receptiveness of different cultural contexts and environments and how they absorb these new technologies and institutions. And of course, how they interact with the existing institutions that they come to meet. So, the problem that we are addressing in very simple and stark terms is the issue of counterfeit medicines. You are looking at what is, in a way, the same medicine, but actually not the same medicine. Because one is a copy of the other, and it's made by, not by a legitimate manufacturer who has a license to produce it, but by somebody who wants to profit from the established brand and the fact that there's a trusting relationship between those who use these types of medicines and the medicine itself. And so this person or group of individuals have created a version of it that from the uh, point of view of an ordinary patient looks completely identical. So I picked up um, a very popular medicine that I'm sure most of you will have interacted with this morning, toothpaste. And um, you know, I had very little qualms that it was the genuine one as I picked it up, mostly because of where I was picking it up, and that tends to be the issue. In many parts of Africa and in South Asia, when people buy medicine, they often have to make a choice. But the choice that they are making, if they are well informed, is that they have one in two chances of picking something that might actually kill them. So it's very dramatic. In Nigeria, 45% of the medicines are estimated to be counterfeit. And this is based on deep research conducted by rather reputable organizations like Business Monitor International. We, the West African Health Organization did another study in Guinea, and they discovered that in Guinea, the rate is even worse more than 60%. That is to say, six out of 10 of the medicines that you pick up the shelf could contain toxins or other substances that rather than improve your health, might actually do you more harm. And it's that simple. The health implications of this phenomenon is easily illustrated when you look at factories like this, where these medicines are made. This was uncovered in the Philippines well, they were making counterfeit Viagra. Of course, some might wonder whether that is a life-saving medicine. <laughs> but, the truth, <laughs> but the truth is that they could have been making anything, including medicines used for the management and treatment of many of the non-communicable diseases that Professor Lavana has already mentioned. So this is clearly important. And I, I put up this slide because for many people, when you mention counterfeit medicines or copies of medicines, the first thing that comes up to mind is how different is that from a counterfeit bag or a counterfeit watch? Are these people just making some profit? The truth is that it's much worse because given the nature of the medicine industry, it's almost impossible to copy medicines at the same level of quality and still make profit. Because the medicines are high volume driven, they are driven by very low profit margins in some instances, particularly in the generic space where I work. And the fact also that as technologies become more complex, the supply chains themselves have grown extremely complicated in order to save costs. So for somebody, you know, copying these medicines in a couple of small factories, the only way you can maintain your profit levels is to cut down quality dramatically. So we've never encountered a process of manufacturing counterfeit medicine or a system of producing these medicines which maintain the quality at the same level as the original. And here we have a huge political dimension to the matter because in many parts of South Asia, as in India and Bangladesh, this issue has become mired in politics, where some believe that this whole notion about counterfeit medicines are actually 
an elaborate ploy by pharmaceutical companies, particularly multinational pharmaceutical companies, to prevent the entry into the market of cheaper but equally life-saving generic medicines. But because I work with generic manufacturers, and I understand that they face the same level of difficulty, which is that their medicines are also routinely counterfeited, I understand that quite clearly this problem goes beyond a simple attempt to use politics to prevent it, even though people might obviously capitalize on it for political reasons. But the truth is that there is a real threat out there, and counterfeit medicines could be generic medicines as well as branded medicines. To give you a bit more illustration, two years ago we had an incident where that medicine in the hands of that gentleman, which is the most widely prescribed anti-malaria in that part of the world, manufactured by a very reputable pharmaceutical manufacturer, was successfully counterfeited to the point where there were sufficient numbers of these anti-malarials in the market in the second largest city of, Kuma, of Ghana called Kumasi that nearly all the medicines, this particular medicine, nearly all the copies of the medicine had to be withdrawn from shelves in pharmacies across the city center, creating an access problem. And that's the story that Ajit mentioned, which is to say that when counterfeiting gets to the extent that they've gotten in some countries, it doesn't matter that enough money may be spent or resources may be spent procuring the medicines, as we've seen with the Global Fund and other such interventions. If the quality is threatened to a certain point, the access to medicines issue itself becomes problematic because people cannot rely on the public supply chain for the medicines that they need to manage the condition that they have, and that is very critical. In this particular instance, we had a situation where the, the, this particular uh, pack of medicine, Coatem, became almost damaged as a brand because patients could no longer trust it. They were not sure which ones were genuine, which ones were not. And that is obviously the most important problem that the public health system faces as a result of this. So, how have we gone about trying to solve it? You are looking at a label, and this label is for a drug that addresses the problem of serious malnutrition in Ghana. And what you have on the upper right hand of it is a scratch panel. A scratch panel is an obscuring layer over a code. And that scratch panel on the upper right hand side, maybe I'll just show you, this one here. When the patient picks up the medicine, and this label will be on the medicine, they can scratch that panel, this one off, and a code will be revealed, a unique code will be revealed. And it is this code that is sent to a special hotline. Think of it like a 911 hotline or a 999 hotline if you're from the United Kingdom. They will send it in a text message. And in two seconds or less, they'll get a response back certifying three things. One, that this is the original pack of medicine as it left the factory. So we, that addresses some of the trademark issues that are of interest in certain uh, jurisdictions. But also, two, that this medicine is registered and certified as competent in that jurisdiction by the uh, competent regulatory authorities obviously by the government. And thirdly, that since that medicine left the factory and was certified, there have been no other incidents in the marketplace which will have warranted a withdrawal of the license of that medicine. So there is no blacklist outstanding against that medicine. So that simple text message that they receive in that two seconds relies on an entire institutional framework in order to inform the patient that that medicine is good for you as opposed to bad for you. But obviously, I'm sure most of you will have realized that all these other institutional frameworks must be functioning for that to work. But for a patient, that simple interface is powerful enough for them to evaluate the overall institutional culture in that country and whether it works or not. And I think that you know, come, brings back some of the arguments we've been having this morning about the fact that people want things very simple and at the same time, complexity is required at the back end to continue to maintain the integrity of the system. Because if the regulator doesn't do their work properly, then getting assurance by a text message that the regulator has done their work do you no good. And I think that you know, when we're talking about the issue to do with journalism and new media and the rest of it, the question that came, kept popping up in different guises was the fact that, well, we may have democratized access to information, and we may have produced tools that allow for the quick replication of information. But what about authority? What about legitimacy? What about expertise? The fact that you send a tweet along doesn't change the fact that wisdom has to be contained in that tweet. 
It doesn't, it doesn't substitute for wisdom. It doesn't substitute for authority, and it doesn't substitute for leadership. So you may be able to inform people at the point of purchase, which is revolutionary in all its implications, that they've got something that can save their lives, but it does require that the authority of that system should have been maintained up to that point. So I'll illustrate how this looks like in the real world. This video was taken by one of our pharmaceutical partners in Nigeria. elaborate on the process a bit further, each pack has a different ID. And that itself requires innovations in the way that printing is done. Because traditionally, when you look at this, all packs of the same size of Colgate have the same ID. We had to innovate with Xerox and other companies to ensure that we could deploy this cheaply in a sense in which the pharmaceutical company did not have to bear extra cost in applying a unique ID to the pack, which is a completely different process. Secondly, the SMS had to go to a short code. The short code, think of it like a hotline. In this case, a four-digit number, phone number, a very special four-digit phone number that they can memorize, but which over time is branded itself as a gateway for trust. And this number has to be issued by all the telecom companies operating in that country under a common and uniform protocol. So what happens is that once that has been done, the SMS acquiring the code on the pack goes to a data center that is not fitted to the internet, but actually fitted directly to the telecom company, meaning that to get into that database, you have to hack through the telecom company. And obviously, the telecom company has more resources to protect, even than this key, and make, which makes it double difficult to actually do so. But once the data has come in, it is managed by a completely separate party, in this case, Hewlett Packard, which is specialized in the provision of data center infrastructure and its security. So you've looked at all these partnerships that have aligned to, to ensure that the integrity of the process is maintained. You have a government regulator that does the actual certification of the medicines. You've got pharmacists that must tell the patients to do this. You've got drug manufacturers whose role it is to apply the code into the medicine. And then obviously you've got a telecom carrier who carries the messaging. So the point is that you do need these institutional partnerships to be able to make new media truly, truly effective and integrated into the social and the cultural fabric of the country. And for it to be truly effective, these partnerships are not substitutable for any technological innovation that does not recognize the fact that the technology must be embedded in the actual social and cultural context of that system. Thank you very much. <laughs>